application for that. Now, in this occasion, I request Fundable Vice Chancellor Gabriel to address to inaugurate this night and then I invite Dr. Pramit Garu Vice Chancellor. Thank you. Morning. Esteemed members of Dr. K. J. Shankar Memorial Endowment Lecture Committee, Dr. Panda Prakar, Member of Parliament, Secretary of the Trust, Professor N. Nigamurthy Garu, former Vice Chancellor, Kagati University, and Chairman of the Trust, Professor K. Shankar Garu, former Vishar, Kagati University. And Professor B. Venkatram Nitigar, the Visitor of Kakadiya University, Professor K. Srinivasan Senior Fellow, ICSSR, New Delhi. Sir, it is our great honor to have you here to deliver this ninth endowment lecture. I am very thankful to you for accept, accepting our invitation. My colleagues and all the participants of this webinar. At the outset, I pay floral tributes to him by honoring his values and principles. I am very much delighted to associate myself with this prestigious endowment lecture in the memory of Dr. J. Shankar sir on his birth anniversary. Dr. J. Shankar sir is a well known intellectual with a vision and Wisdom. He is an eminent educationist besides being an economist. He is a very good orator and he can speak in multi languages such as Urdu, English, Hindi, and Telugu. The doctrine of Sabri Telangana State is the great child of Dr. Jason He is popularly known as Telangana Siddhanta Karta. He was the guide for the achievement of Telangana state. He has got ex exceptional insights in, into societal needs and he established creative benchmarks wherever he worked and in whatever position he occupied. He is great humanitarian with a positive mind and solved crucial problems with his pragmatic approach. As Rishan of Sweden for a decade, his contributions are marvelous. And as Rishan and Vice Chancellor of Kakatiya University, he developed the university and made the university to reach its heights. His journey always and all through is aimed at the progress of individuals, institutions, and the nation. Sir is committed to excellence and everyday greatness. I am fortunate to have interaction with the sir on several occasions on Telangana issues such as regional disparities. Education, health, irrigation and agriculture in 1988. I entered into university service during his tenure and I am very much influenced by his thoughts and actions. He believed in fair decision making and power implementation. On this occasion, I appeal to future generations that is philosophy and the ideas, principles should be taken as source of inspiration and work towards realization of his goals. I wish the present lecture, Nationalism and Dynamics of Federal Politics in Contemporary India, will be throwing light on the issues and challenges involved and solutions needed. Now I invite the Dr. Bandar Prakash Garu, Member of Parliament, and the secretary, Dr. J. J. Shankar Memorial Trust, to speak. So, if you not ready, then I will follow. Uh, 
హలో హలో అందరికీ నమస్కారం అందరికీ నమస్కారం వినబడుతుందా వీడియో కూడా అన్మ్యూట్ చేయమనండి నా వీడియో వీడియో yeah flip flip the video uh, mode sir yeah now is please go ahead sir hello prakash hello, sir please go ahead sir picture over okay please please andar ke namaskaram dr jayashankar ga 9th స్మారకోపన్యాసానికి ఈరోజు హాజరవుతున్న వారందరికీ హృదయపూర్వక నమస్కారాలు తెలియజేస్తూ ఈ కార్యక్రమంలో పాల్గొంటున్న పెద్దలు గౌరవనీయులు కాకతీయ విశ్వవిద్యాలయ వైస్ ఛాన్సలర్ సుధర్ రమేష్ గారు పెద్దలు గౌరవనీయులు ప్రొఫెసర్ లింగమూర్తి గారు గౌరవనీయ ప్రొఫెసర్ శంకరయ్య గారు గౌరవనీయ ఎండోమెంట్ లెక్చర్ని ఈరోజు మనకు డెలివర్ చేస్తున్న మిత్రులు ప్రొఫెసర్ శ్రీనివాస్ గారు మరియు రిజిస్టార్ గారు ఇంకా ఇందులో పార్టిసిపేట్ అవుతున్న మిత్రులందరికీ హృదయపూర్వక నమస్కారం డాక్టర్ జయశంకర్ గారి ఎండోమెంట్ లెక్చర్ కోసం ఈ సిరీస్ని మనం రెండు వేల ఫస్ట్ లెక్చర్ నేను టూ థౌజండ్ థర్టీన్లో ట్రస్ట్ ఫార్మేషన్తో పాటు లెక్చర్ని కూడా స్టార్ట్ చేయడం జరిగింది అందులో మొదటి లెక్చర్ని ప్రొఫెసర్ హరగోపాల్ గారిని రిక్వెస్ట్ చేసినాం విజన్ ఆఫ్ తెలంగాణ న్యూ తెలంగాణ ఆ లెక్చర్ని ఇవ్వడం జరిగింది సెకండ్ లెక్చర్ని మరి వారితో సన్ని పదాలను ఆర్ విద్యాసాగర్ గారు హరిత తెలంగాణ అనే అంశం మీద వారు కూడా మాట్లాడినారు థర్డ్ లెక్చర్ని శివలింగ్ ప్రసాద్ గారు ఫోర్త్ లెక్చర్ని వెంకట వరవరరావు గారు ఫిఫ్త్ లెక్చర్ని కోకాటే గారు సిక్స్త్ లెక్చర్ని కొండర్రావు గారు సెవెంత్ లెక్చర్ని డాక్టర్ జిఆర్ రెడ్డి గారు లాస్ట్ ఇయర్ ప్రొఫెసర్ గంటా చక్రపాణి గారు డెలివర్ చేయడం జరిగింది ఈరోజు లెక్చర్ని శ్రీనివాస్ గారు నేషనలిజం అండ్ డైనమిక్స్ ఆఫ్ ఫెడరల్ పాలిటిక్స్ అనే అంశం వారు ఇవాళ మాట్లాడినందుకు వారు హృదయపూర్వకంగా ధన్యవాదాలు తెలియజేస్తున్నాను ఈ ఎండోమెంట్ ట్రస్ట్ కూడా డాక్టర్ జయశంకర్ గారి మరణానంతరం వారికి సన్నిహితంగా ఉన్న కొద్దిమంది మిత్రులందరం కలిసి ఈ ఎండోమెంట్ ట్రస్ట్ని ఏర్పాటు చేయడానికి అనుకోవడం రెండు వేల పన్నెండు ఆగస్టు మూడో తారీఖు నాకు గౌరవ రిజిస్ట్రార్ గారికి మేము అందరం ఒక లేఖను సబ్మిట్ చేయడం రెండు వేల పన్నెండులోనే కావాల్సిన ఎండోమెంట్ ట్రస్ట్ కావాల్సిన నిధుల్ని సమకూర్చి అందజేయడం కూడా జరిగింది అంతేకాకుండా వారి గోల్డ్ మెడల్ ను కూడా ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ చేయాలనే ఉద్దేశంతో హైయెస్ట్ మార్క్ సంపాదించిన వాళ్లకు ఒక గోల్డ్ మెడల్ ని ఉద్దేశంతో దానికి కూడా డిపాజిట్ చేయడం సభ్యులతో చేయడం జరిగింది ఎండోమెంట్ మెమోరియల్ ఫౌండేషన్ ట్రస్ట్ ఎగ్జిక్యూటివ్ కమిటీగా మరి ప్రొఫెసర్ లింగమూర్తి గారు ప్రెసిడెంట్గా శంకరయ్య గారు చక్రపాణి గారు వైస్ ప్రెసిడెంట్గా నేను జనరల్ సెక్రటరీగా బ్రహ్మం గారు జాయింట్ సెక్రటరీగా రాముడు గారు ట్రెజరర్గా పులి సారంగపాణి గారు మెంబర్గా దినేష్ కుమార్ గారు వెంకటేశ్వర్లు గారు రామయ్య గారు మెంబర్లుగా ఉన్నారు అంతేకాకుండా పద్దెనిమిది మంది సభ్యులు కాంతిపూర్తి చేసిన మిత్రులందరితో కలిపి ఒక ఆర్గనైజింగ్ కమిటీ ఎండోమెంట్ లెక్చర్ కానీ మిగతా అంశాలని చేయడానికి కోసం చేసినాం అందులో మరి మాతో పాటు ఇప్పుడు నేను చెప్పిన మిత్రులతో పాటు పుల్ రామచంద్ర గారు మరి డాక్టర్ గోవర్ధన్ గారు 
ఏ సత్యనారాయణ గారు యోగాచార్య గారు సమ్మయ్య గారు ఆత్మలింగం గారు మరియు డాక్టర్ ఎల్ఏ గారు ప్రొఫెసర్ ఎల్ఏ గారు కూడా ఇందులో సభ్యులుగా ఉన్నారు మరి క్రమం తప్పకుండా ఆగస్టు ఆరో రోజునే దీన్ని ఏర్పాటు చేయాలని సంకల్పించడం దాదాపుగా దానికే స్టిక్ అవుతూ పనిచేస్తూ వచ్చినాం ఒకటి రెండు సందర్భాల్లో మరి లాస్ట్ ఇయర్ కొంత కోవిడ్ పరిస్థితుల కారణంగా కూడా డేట్స్లో కొంత తేడా రావడం జరిగింది అంతకుముందు కూడా ఒకటి రెండు సందర్భాల్లో అటువంటి పరిస్థితి వచ్చింది అయినప్పటికీ కూడా క్రమం తప్పకుండా జయశంకర్ గారి ఆ ఆలోచనలు ఆశయాలకు అనుగుణంగానే ఈ లెక్చర్స్ అన్నిటినీ ఉండాలి వారు కోరుకున్న పద్ధతిలోనే తెలంగాణ రాష్ట్రానికి ఇంకా మనం ఎక్కువ సమాచారాన్ని అందించే విధంగా మన లెక్చర్సు ఉండాలని కోరుకున్న నేపథ్యంలో ఇవాళ శ్రీనివాస్ గారు ఇస్తున్న లెక్చర్ కూడా ప్రస్తుత పరిస్థితుల్లో దేశం ఎదుర్కొంటున్న స్థితిగతుల్లో తెలంగాణ నాటి నూతన రాష్ట్రానికి మాట్లాడుతున్నందుకు సంతోషంగా ఉందని నేను తెలియజేసుకుంటూ ముఖ్యంగా ఈరోజు ఈ లెక్చర్ సిరీస్ ఆర్గనైజ్ చేయడానికి చొరవ తీసుకున్న మిత్రులు వైస్ ఛాన్సలర్ రమేష్ గారికి శ్రీ స్టార్ గారికి కాకతీయ విశ్వవిద్యాలయ అధ్యాపకులందరికీ హృదయపూర్వకంగా ధన్యవాదాలు తెలియజేస్తూ ఇందులో పాల్గొంటున్న పెద్దలు శంకరయ్య గారు లింగమూర్తి గారు దీనికి చొరవ తీసుకొని పనిచేస్తున్నందుకు వారికి కూడా ధన్యవాదాలు తెలియజేస్తూ ఇంతకుముందే మేము తెలంగాణ భవన్లో డాక్టర్ జయ జయశంకర్ గారి జయంతి వేడుకలు జరుపుకొని ఇప్పుడే ఇందులో పాల్గొనడం జరుగుతున్నది ఈ అవకాశం ఇచ్చిన మీ అందరికి కూడా వర్చువల్గా పాల్గొనడానికి అనుమతి ఇచ్చి అవకాశం ఇచ్చిన మిత్రులందరికీ కూడా నేను హృదయపూర్వకంగా ధన్యవాదాలు తెలియజేస్తున్నాను థ్యాంక్ యూ థ్యాంక్ యూ థ్యాంక్ యూ సార్ డాక్టర్ బండ ప్రకాష్ గారు థ్యాంక్ యూ ఫర్ యువర్ మెసేజ్ అండ్ ఫర్ ఎక్స్ప్లెయినింగ్ ద యాక్టివిటీస్ ఆఫ్ ది ట్రస్ట్ నౌ ఐఎమ్ ఇన్వైట్ ప్రొఫెసర్ ఎన్ లింగమూర్తి గారు ఫార్మర్ వైస్ ఛాన్సలర్ కాకతీయ యూనివర్సిటీ అండ్ చైర్మన్ ఆఫ్ ది ట్రస్ట్ టు స్పీక్ ఆన్ ది అకేషన్ so uh, honorable vice chancellor of uh, kakati university professor t ramesh garu and the uh, vice chairman of the jay shankar memorial foundation trust professor a shankar garu the registrar of the university professor b venkatram garu the members of the trust and uh, the family members of dr jay shankar mr brahma and his wife swati and uh, all the members who are uh, sitting here all members who are uh, sitting here and participating in this lecture hmm? good morning to you all president of the occasion and uh, vice chancellor kakati university respected professor tatikonda ramesh garu honorable member of rajya sabha and also secretary of the trust dr banda prakash garu professor lingamurthi garu former vice chancellor and president of the trust today's guest speaker is k srinivas garu senior fellow ssr indian council of social science research registrar of the university professor venkatram reddy garu teaching and non teaching staff members administrative officers retired professors professor murli manohar krishna patari family members of Dr. Jay Shankar Sir, Ramam and Swati and uh, there is a very close friend of Dr. Jay Shankar Sir, he is good. See, Venkateshwar Nudar, very close friend. Jigri Dost, he used to call him and he is still well and healthy. He is in Harmukha Tavali, in action sir, Venkateshwar Nudar. Disciple Sir, Jay Shankar Sir. and uh, media friends i am 
happy to associate myself with the ninth element lecture program in memory of dear Dr. Jayashin Kassar. I am happy because I was very closely associated with him for more than two decades. I had the privilege of working with him as the registrar of Kakati University when Dr. Jayashin Kassar was the vice chancellor. He was a towering personality, very good administrator, and also academician equally, great visionary, scrupulously honest, and possessing very clean habits, not bothered for any position, not at all greedy, and most unselfish, ego all. He was a very good host. As an academician, he was a very popular teacher and uh, already Mr. Lingamurthy said he started his career as a teacher and ended as a vice chancellor of an academic institution of a university. And a very powerful, powerful speaker in English, Telugu and Urdu languages. Whatever language he used to speak, very beautiful, wonderful language he used to say. And he was a good researcher because he wrote many books, particularly in the Bhagavatam of Telangana. And all the books were based on facts and figures. And uh, about the causes, everything he mentioned meticulously. As an administrator, I watched him very closely. He possessed excellent qualities such as leadership skills, communication skills, communication skills, conceptual skills, human relations skills, and above all, listening skills. See, most of us, we don't have the patience to listen to others. When somebody comes to us, then before he the person completes, we start trying to say something. But it was not the case with the documentation concern. First of all, he used to listen carefully, then he used to give answers very meticulously and the perfect answers. So for an administrator. Listening skill is a very, very important skill that was possessed by him. Then he was teacher, then became principal of CKM College, as all of you are known, then registrar of Kakti University, then registrar of CFL for a decade, then vice chancellor of Kakti University. Wherever he worked, he left his own trademark regarding the administration and also in academic matters. He never compromised regarding the quality of any activity, whether it is an academic or administration or in the construction or in appointments, whatever it may be, he used to be top priority. Then above all, he used to favor the local people. In almost all the selections, I was associated with him. You know, selection company means experts come from different universities. Then, before commencement of the proceedings, he used to say, friends, we give priority to merit subject to the reservation policy. We cannot afford to ignore the reservations that is there. But at the same time, merit must be the top priority. Suppose with the local person and the outside person are, say, equal in the performance and uh, other academic matters, give priority and preference to the local people and give preference to the Telangana people. And that was his priority, and he used to follow it meticulously and scrupulously. Very good administrator. And, uh, and, and you know, just as I also told him, he used to say, don't never, never run after positions. 
but never run away from the responsibilities. Never run away from the responsibilities. Thank you. Sir, I was uh, even after his retirement and uh, after my retirement, I was, and, uh, I was very closely associated with uh, his family and uh, I feel sorry for his absence and I feel Telangana is unfortunate to miss his presence. And uh, today, if Jayashankar sir was alive, definitely the shape of the uh, academic institutions, particularly higher education, they have been somewhat different because he never compromised with the quality of quantity also he favored the large scale expansion took place under the jurisdiction of Kharkiv University when he was the vice chancellor. And uh, at the same time, he never compromised with the quality of the standards of the education. So here in fact I am here to introduce the guest speaker of today, Professor K. Srinivas Rugaru. Senior Fellow, ICSSR, New Delhi. Uh, the lecture is on nationalism and dynamics of federal politics in contemporary India. I am really uh, happy to introduce Professor Srinivas Rigaru. He is a good academician. Professor Srinivas completed MA Political Science from Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, in the year 1981. Then he completed his MPhil also from JNU in the year 1984. Then he also obtained PhD degree from JNU in the year 1988. And I understand uh, he started his career as a lecturer in our Kakatiya University. After working for a few years, he was appointed by Usmania University, the Department of Political Science, and uh, he retired there in uh, Usmania University as professor. <coughs> professor Srinivasu served as a chairman of Board of Studies in Political Science, uh, Usmania University from year 2005 to 2007. And he also appointed as a chairman board of studies. Uh, uh, then he introduced many latest uh, subordinates, the syllabus content and the subject of the political science when he was the chairman of board of studies. Then from 2007 to 2009, he became the head of the department of political science. Mm -hmm. Then from 2014 to 2016, he served as Deep Faculty of Political Science to Social Sciences of Usmania University. Then, apart from that, he was a uh, member of many academic advisory uh, positions in other institutions, uh, like Member Research Advisory Committee, National Institute of Rural Development, Hyderabad, then Member Departmental Committee, Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad. Then member, Academic Council, Madras Institute of Development Studies uh, in the year 2013 to 2015. Then he was member, Advisory Committee of the Project on the Efficacy of Affirmative Action Policies in India's Education System, a study of scheduled cast in Karnataka, funded by Indian Council of Social Science Research, then he was also a member of Department Committee, Department of Political Science, Northeast Hill University. Apart from the academic advisory positions, he was also the examiner of many research thesis, that is, MPhil and uh, PhD thesis, examiner for uh, research uh, degrees of University of Delhi, Jawaharlal Nehru University of Delhi. Ignore Delhi, University of Hyderabad, then uh, University of Mumbai, University of Kerala, University of Mysore, and Bangalore University. Apart from that, he uh, has many publications. He was co author, and uh, his publications are 
about uh, three dozens. Then published in very popular journals like the uh, uh, Economic and Political Weekly. Uh, then Indian, Indian Journal of Public Administration and uh, some other journals. And he also delivered extension lectures in Bhagavad University and some other universities. And he co authored many books also. Where, say, very good academic professor. And I'm really happy to uh, introduce him for this program. And before I conclude, I would like to say uh, one or two things. Let me once again, congratulate Professor Ramesh for assuming charges <coughs> Vice Chancellor of Kakati University. Very enthusiastic. He has a lot of such enthusiasm to improve the performance of the institution. I am sure with his dedication and commitment, he will be successful in all his academic and administrative endeavors, and I wish him all success. Professor Venkatra already, registrar of the university. I know him from the last three decades. Very honest man, very sincere man, and a very competent person also. And he also has a lot of enthusiasm to uh, improve the performance of the university. And uh, I'm sure uh, in the combination of both uh, Professor Ramesh and Professor Venkatra already, the university will certainly improve its performance. And uh, one more thing I would like to say, I already said in the DC office. So, Jay Shankar sir used to say, Vice Chancellor and Registrar relationship is wife and husband relationship. Then, on some occasion, I asked him, Sir, who is wife, who is wife, who is husband? Then he said, There is no fixed relation between Registrar and Vice Chancellor. Sometimes Registrar will be the wife, sometimes Vice Chancellor will be the wife. And uh, both of us, may have difference of opinion, but ultimately we should work in a coordinated manner. And the coordination, cooperation is a very, very important matter. And I'm sure both Mr. Venkatramanity and Mr. Ramesh Garu will work in a coordinated manner, and I'm sure they will take the university to the heights and for improving the performance of the university. I'm thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Professor Shankaraya Garu for introducing Professor K. Srinivasulu and his achievements. Now I am, I now feel pleasure to invite Professor K. Srinivasulu Garu, Senior Fellow, Indian Council of Social Science Research, New Delhi, to deliver Dr. K. J. Shankar Memorial Endowment Lecture, sir. Sir, Sinat, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, T. Ramesh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Kakti University, Professor N. Lingamurthy, uh, Chairman uh, Dr. K. Jayashankar Memorial Trust, Professor A. Shankaraya, Vice Chairman Dr. Banda Prakash, Secretary of the Trust, and uh, Professor D. Venkatram Reddy, Registrar, Kakti University, and dignitaries on the dais, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very thankful to Kakti University and also to Dr. K. J. Shankar Memorial Trust for this invitation to deliver uh, Dr. K. J. Shankar Endowment Lecture this year. Uh, it's a sort of homecoming for me, of course, virtually, <laughs> uh, for my association with Kakti University uh, goes back to 1984 when I joined the Department of Political Science. Uh, the new department that was created then, you know. And I left uh, Kakti University in 1990 and joined Osman University. Uh, in two ways, I missed uh, an active interaction with Professor uh, Jay Shankar. Because just before I joined, uh, he left uh, uh, the uh, registrarship of Kakti University. And I think he joined uh, CFL, CAFL then. Now it's called FLU. And only after I left Kakti University in 1990, I think early 90s, he became the Vice Chancellor. So I, I did not have the opportunity to uh, know him uh, 
personally in 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 kak university uh but it was only later uh, in in the midst of uh, the telangana movement i had uh, had occasions to meet him and interact with him and i fondly recollect my interactions one day i came home late then i was informed that there was a phone call uh and the name mentioned was jay shankar i mean he was so humble that he didn't even introduce him uh himself properly and uh, i was wondering who is this jay shankar uh with with a note that uh, he would again call me the next day morning so at 8 o'clock next day i got the phone call and i was surprised that it was dr jay shankar uh then he said uh, that time i was working in nizam college so he said i'll come to nizam college to meet you i said please don't come sir i'll come to you and those days uh, whenever he used to visit uh, hyderabad he used to stay in a flu uh so he said i stay in the eflu guest house so if you don't mind i said definitely not so i went and in fact i was with him uh this was after lunch so i was with him for almost one and a half hour and discuss a whole lot of things i was surprised that uh, you were in fact monitoring uh, uh, the research of people especially those who are interested in that was a time when i was publishing in epw on telangana also so by by monitoring that he wanted to interact with me and later uh, in the thick of the telangana movement you know there were several occasions like uh, the university students organized several meetings that time i was uh, the head of the department so i happened to chair the session and in fact one day uh, uh, the seminar was over by lunch time so we requested him to stay back and have lunch with us and uh, he kindly accepted and uh, in fact it was a very very fruitful interaction uh, with him. some of the faculty members were there uh with his very deep knowledge and long experience and very active association from 1960s onwards uh so all that was a, a, a very very uh, interesting and very deep learning process for some of us uh so by inviting me to uh, be part of this endowment uh, uh, lecture program in fact you uh, you you took me back to those uh, years 1990s and 2000 uh, decade 2000 uh so by i deem it as a privilege uh, to be invited to develop, deliver this lecture uh the theme of this lecture uh, is i think uh, i would not be wrong in saying that it, it it's it's a very closely related theme to the intellectual and political concerns of uh, dr jayashank the concerns which were very dear to him uh because all of you know that he was deeply committed to the issue of telangana and by extension to the question of small states Uh, which which was essential uh, because if you look at the uh, states reorganization uh, that happened in the 1950s basically it happened on the principle of language but subsequently uh, most of these uh, linguistic states uh, in fact uh, became uh, sites of uh, contradiction basically based on the logic of uneven development and also because of the historical asymmetry uh, Uh, so wherever uh, the states with different historical uh, regions with different historical backdrops were merged and formed uh, into one state on the linguistic principle there you see the dissensions and the demands for uh, new states okay and uh, the question of uh, small states the question of uh, reorganization of the uh, federal structure uh, is very crucial to the uh, existence uh, and uh, and thriving of india as a federal state and as you know uh, that uh, the, the question of federal character of indian state uh, in the last decade or so has come under serious scandal okay and this is widely shared kind of apprehension uh, among the journalists uh, political commentators academic uh, researchers specializing on indian federalism that uh, indian state indian indian uh, central state is in fact once again uh, uh, exhibiting centralizing tendency uh which is much more serious than the kind of centralization that we saw in the 1970s uh, uh during the congress raj uh, headed by mrs indira gandhi and uh, the symptoms of this centralization uh, are very very clear in the present political dispensation at the center uh on various fronts in terms of the persona Uh, in terms of the style of governance uh, political rhetoric 
okay uh, the kind of uh, policy regime the policy making and policy execution and also the the kind of uh, interplay between the political executive and uh, the institutions uh, both the administrative institutions also legal constitutional institutions okay which seem to be subject to some kind of marginalization uh, neglect even manipulation so there are serious kind of uh, allegations in the current contemporary political uh, journalistic debate uh, uh, in in the country uh, there is also a tendency to 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 characterize the present phase of centralization in indian polity uh, as a mere repetition okay but uh, i i don't subscribe to that kind of uh, point of view because if you, if you look at the uh, journalistic uh, uh, and also political commentaries on on uh, the present phase uh, there is there is a very serious attempt to compare uh, present regime with mrs gandhi's regime uh, narendra modi with uh, indira gandhi but i think that is uh, an inappropriate one because if you if you look at the context the logic and the ideology that informs the present uh, uh, development of centralization in indian polity uh, they vary uh, greatly okay both uh, qualitatively and also in terms of uh, the substance okay the subject matter of uh, the, the the centralization and also the intensity and expanse of central age. Uh, so how to understand this is a question. I think uh, uh, the present context of centralization has to be, I mean, generally uh, centralization, or political centralization and uh, associated to that the economic uh, centralization, both in terms of policy making, policy implementation, uh, has to be understood uh, to make it uh, more meaningful and also to understand the depth of that to the macro narrative okay uh, that informs the political social economic processes and the macro narrative is obviously of the nation and nationalism okay and uh, in the last uh, uh, decade or so you very clearly see a hegemonic shift in the narrative okay uh, and this hegemonic shift in fact forms the context and informs the logic of uh, centralization in the present uh, politics uh, this shift hegemonic shift uh, encompasses the political ideological party related and also institutional changes so therefore it's not a superficial kind of uh, mere political ideological it's it's a larger kind of uh, uh, shift that we see in the uh, nature of hegemony political hegemony in india secondly what what adds uh, meat to uh, this hegemonic shift to my mind uh, is uh, the macro shift in the political economy of uh, development in India from uh, state planned economy that was followed uh, after independence to uh, a liberalized market economy that happened uh, that was initiated in the mid 80s but uh, pursued uh, vigorously after 1990 okay under the uh, leadership of uh, P. Vinay and this political economy of development, okay, and it's a shift to a neoliberal market economy, in fact, has generated and also perpetuated uh, a, a logic of uneven development, which has created its own fault lines of, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that it, it, it eliminated or avoided the earlier fault lines, but in fact, it has, on the one hand, strengthened the older fault lines, and in fact, created new fault lines in terms of regions, classes, castes, communities, so on and so forth. So therefore, you see uh, some kind of uh, uh, unrest across the spatial and social uh, uh, domains, okay? Uh, so therefore, it is in this context, in the context of one, the macroeconomic, uh, change uh, to a market economy secondly the shift in the hegemonic uh, uh, nation nationalism narrative okay uh, makes us to re-examine okay the relation between region and nation state and center uh, to put it more abstractly part and whole and also uh, we need to map the trajectory of 
both continuity and it doesn't mean that it's it's, it's only change it's, there is also continuity uh, to understand the uh, the the, the uh, trajectory of india's federal democratic journey uh, so th this is a theme which uh, dr jayashankar would have very very uh, deeply be interested and in, uh, perhaps uh, he himself was very very deeply engaged with as part of the uh, telangana movement so what i shall do is to make the presentation in uh, five parts firstly i will try to uh, map the macro context of indian politics okay as i said uh, with the idea of uh, nation nationalism and contestations are on it that is that it's, it's uniformly accepted that there are serious contestations from coming from different uh, uh different sectors of different spheres of uh, uh, social and political life uh secondly i would uh, try to uh, map the uh center state relations through some kind of periodization because unless we have that historical sensitivity to the uh periodization of the evolution of center state relations we wouldn't be able to understand the present phase of centralization and its specificity to political and historical specificity. Therefore, that is, that is the second uh, aspect which I would focus on. Thirdly, uh, uh, deeper to this, internal to this, rather organic to this is uh, the third aspect, that is the political, ideological, and electoral and party uh, basis of uh, change, okay, which informs both the regional assertion and also uh, creates its own uh, centralizing tendencies. Uh, and central to this, to my mind, are two contradictory and also associated processes. I mean, it's a very peculiar kind of paradox. One is you see some kind of regeneration of national politics. On the other hand, you also see some kind of nationization of, okay, not centralization, nationization of regional politics and regional parties. Okay, that is the interesting kind of development that we see in Indian politics in the post-emergency period and much more significantly from 90s, 90s, 70s, uh, 90s, 80s, 90s, late 80s, 90s, and in 2000. Okay. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, I would try to, I mean, it's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a fact more or less widely accepted, uh, not, not something which is controverted, is that there is a renewal of, uh, renewed trend of centralization uh, in Indian politics. And what is that? What's the character of that what is the what is the morphology or physiology of that centralization that would be an interesting thing to uh, uh to, to reflect on fourthly uh is, is it an unchallenged is centralization okay in indian federation is an unchallenged fact or are there challenges to it are there possibilities of okay uh correcting the course of development to restore some kind of balanced and democratic resolution of federal question that so where are the uh, where, where does the hope lie what are the what are the uh, sources of hope and, uh, and and positive expectation that is the question which we need to i think uh, reflect on uh, it may not be reality but uh, there are, there could be clear signs of such a possibility existing <laughs> so coming to the first question uh, at the center of contemporary indian politics Obviously, is the question of identity. Any, any, in the history of any nation, nation state, okay, identity is central. Identity based on regions, uh, communities, cultural identity, religious identity, so on and so on. And the existence of a nation and its harmony depends on to what extent, okay, it achieves some kind of balance and unity in this diversity. Okay, and if you look at uh, the early debate, both both in the uh, nationalist movement and subsequently uh, during the course of uh, the constitution making in the constituent assembly i mean i had uh, several occasions to go back to the constituent assembly debates uh, as part of my uh, research interest so i'm i'm somewhat familiar with the uh, debate within the constituent assembly which involved a very serious uh, not pol political minds interestingly very very deeply constitutional minds most of them were uh, lawyers you know uh, well-trained lawyers so the, the debate uh debates in the constant assembly were very dense on variety of issues okay including on the question of nationalism and the question of nation and what kind of 
nation that India ought to be, okay, what kind of nation that actually it is and what kind of nation it has to be uh, uh, transformed into, okay. And one of the important effects uh, in this uh, whole debate uh, was the question of unity and diversity. So now uh, this question has come under tremendous uh, criticism. Uh, it, 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 in fact, had its own weaker moments, so to say. Uh, so therefore, the question continues to uh, to be relevant to ask whether you call it diversity or difference, okay? uh, because of uh, the multi-ethnic, uh, multi-regional, multicultural, multi-religious, okay, multi-linguistic kind of situation that India is. Okay, uh, it's a very complex kind of uh, okay composite uh, cultural, social, uh, economic scenario that India presents. Therefore, the question of uh unity and difference question of identity and uh, uh harmony continue to be politically relevant so therefore we need to ask such question and that question becomes uh, very very important today uh, because of the, uh, the, the the excess emphasis on the question of nation national unity and threat to nation that has become part of our everyday political discourse so therefore it becomes important to ask this question that does not does or does not the pan indian identity okay accommodate or exist and live well with the assertion of regional linguistic political identities that's the question so pan indian okay, national identity and regional sub regional cultural linguistic identities what is the relationship between these two is the question and this uh, any answer any attempt to answer this question this question has to uh, be informed by okay the historical political economic and deeper social cultural symbolic factors because if you look at uh, indian politics it's deeply in, in informed by symbolism political symbolism okay and what are the resources and investments for such kind of resolution is is a question which uh, is relevant okay uh, to, to answer this. So therefore, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, we, need, we need to engage with, with this question. And any politics of hegemony seeks to answer this question, okay, by, by emphasizing on one or the other aspect. So there is some kind of unitarian kind of emphasis uh, in the hegemonic politics. So if we recognize this, so we can identify two kinds of okay uh, two phases in the in the structuring of hegemonic politics uh, centered around the idea of nation and nationalism in indian political history after independence one is that kind of uh, unity based on nation nationalism championed by the congress okay and it had its own brand of nationalism that we all know and that brand of nationalism, okay, uh, is uh, traced back to by the Congress and also by observers, scholars uh, who, who have written on uh, the question of nationalism, back to the anti-colonial nationalist movement. So the whole history of century world history of Indian national uh, movement in its various phases, okay, uh, is seen to be the legacy of the Indian National Congress, uh, whether it has uh, enriched that legacy or whether it has uh, led to the withering and weakening of that legacy is a, is, is a different uh, critical question. The second kind of hegemonic uh, structure is based on the Hindutva nationalism. Okay? Uh, the current uh, dominant hegemonic structure is this Hindutva nationalism. So there are two kinds of uh, attempts to shape Indian politics after independence by these two dominant okay versions, two dominant visions of nationalism. The so-called Congress secular nationalist hegemony. Second is the idea of Hindutva nationalism. But yet, if you look at critically in the intersizes of Indian politics, especially from 80s to uh, 2000s, almost two, two, three decades, two and a half, three decades. Okay, we find a third strand, 
which try to articulate Indian identity okay, by highlighting the difference, but to emphasize not compromising on the unity and integrity. Okay, that is the kind of idea of Indian identity. Okay, central to it was the assertion of regional identities. You see, all those uh, coalitional governments, United Front, National Front, UPA, uh, NDA1, NDA2, all these were coalitional governments where the regional parties were central to the government formation. And they were not only central in just putting together okay, a coalitional government, but they were central even in the decision-making process. And they played a very key, key role. Okay, if, if, you, if you just go back and uh, recollect our memories, okay, they played a very key role in the policy making processes. But what is unfortunate is that did this strand, okay, the regional identity based idea of India, okay, is not uh, could not become hegemonic. It had its own ups and downs because of internal tensions and contradictions and differences but also because it has not been sufficiently theorized uh, by social scientists to my mind. And now I think uh, we need to uh, take it up as a, as a challenge. Um, critical to, as, as, as you can very clearly note, the critical to this is the idea of nation nationalism. So let me take a short detour, theoretical detour to the idea of nationalism. And one of the prominent theories of nationalism uh, in, in, the, in the political theory tradition uh, was a British uh, political theorist by name Benedict Anderson. I'm taking up uh, Benedict Anderson because Benedict Anderson's uh, theoretical propositions in fact capture uh, both the history of nation nationalism as it developed uh, in the West. And the idea of nation and nationalism is hardly two and, two and a half centuries old. Okay, you, you did not have a nation in the medieval period, for instance. You did not have an idea of nation in the 16th, 17th century. So it is already two and two and of uh, centuries old idea as as a both political idea also as a political reality. Okay, formation of nation states is is very short uh, in terms of uh, larger, longer human history. How does he define uh, nation? He defines nation as an imagined community. I mean, what is important for a for a, for a region okay, to project itself as a nation and nation state is that all the people who live in that, okay, whom we call in the modern political language citizen, because you didn't have citizen in the 17th century, you only had subjects. Only the nation state, that in a democratic nation state, you have the idea of citizen. Okay? So all the people living in that area have to imagine to begin with themselves as citizens and the concept of citizen okay emphasizes is underlined by the idea of equality all the citizens are equal not in substantive economic or social sense but definitely in a uh, in, a, in a juridical sense in a legal constitutional sense they are all equals okay because all of them have one vote and have equal right to participate in the making of the governments, electing the governments. What in fact forged this sense of imagination? So when they feel, all of them feel that they are equal, cutting across the substantive social uh, economic differences, then they have an equal chance to participate in the making of, okay, in the shaping of the country, its politics, its nationalism. How could it be? How could this uh, idea of imagined community evolve and become a reality? Is a substantive question. And you say it, it raises it to two important uh, developments that happened in the modern period, okay, from 17th, 18th century onwards. One is the massive expansion of print uh, capitalism, okay, in the form of newspapers, in the form of uh, literature, for instance, novel becomes in a modern uh, literary form of expression. So new forms of literary cultural expression, okay, get widely circulated and available to larger sections of the people because of the revolutionization of print technology. That's one. Second thing what happens is that because of the spread of the media, okay, the print media, 
and because of the instrumentality of a novel as a literary expression, there is an attempt to standardize the language. I mean, even if you take a fairly homogeneous kind of country like France or England, okay, you have so much of regional dialectical variation. Even today, I mean, if you go from one part of England to another part of England, the kind of language they speak, the uh, expressions, the metaphors, they use is totally different. It's not the standard English that we are familiar with. Okay, I mean, the popular cinema, in fact, uh, popular English cinema or American cinema, in fact, makes us sensitive to that kind of dialectical diversity. diversity. So, but what has happened because of the expansion of print capitalism is that homogenization of standardization of language so that people could communicate with each other across the regions, across the regional cultural uh, diversity. Okay. So, these are the two important things that have led to the formation of uh, nation state. Now the question is that can that idea of an imagined community be transposed onto an Indian uh, reality, okay, without any problem? Is the transference of that notion of uh, imagined a nation as an imagined community uh, be unproblematic in the context of okay, India, given its colonial, late modern? Okay, multilingual, diverse cultural context okay, is a question which, uh, which becomes relevant. So therefore, when we talk about the idea of India as a nation, okay, we need to keep all these diversities in view. But it must go, it, it must go to the merit of Indian nationalist movement that in the course of the nationalist movement and the debates that has it has generated, okay, not merely politically. Literally, culturally, I mean, if you look at the regional literatures, for instance, Telugu literature, or even if you look at the Hindi literature, there is a lot of work on how the idea of India as a nation evolved in the Hindi literature. So there's a lot of work in the last few decades, okay, in the last three, four decades, because of the rise of what is called uh, the, uh, the cultural studies <laughs> discipline. So we are now familiar that even the popular uh, literature, media, all these things have strove, have strove to build a an idea of India. And what is unique to this idea of India, to my mind, is that it is very tolerant, inclusive, heterogeneous, and plural. Okay. Therefore, it doesn't fit into the Andersonian, Benedict Anderson's perspective, okay, our frame, but definitely that perspective, that insight of language, culture being in important instruments informs us. So therefore, it's a different kind of notion because of the colonial of a large sectors of Indian society being pre-modern. Okay, there, this tolerant, plural, heterogeneous notion of uh, India and this heterogeneity, I mean, there may be potential areas of contradiction and contestation, but largely because of the political level of the nationalist leadership, enlightened national leadership. Okay. All these differences were sought to be made complementary and harmonious with each other. That's the, that's the point which we need to. And they were also wary of the possibility of fault lines developing, maybe activated, and deepening in the future. I mean, at many places in the Constant Assembly, uh, debates were uh, conducted on this issue, on the issue of national integration, national unity. Given the fact that all these differences, okay, are are potentially pregnant with divergence, disunity, and maybe disintegration, so they were very very sensitive. So now the question is, how do you protect this diversity and difference? Okay, and obviously it, it has to be. It's a multifarious, multi-leveled kind of thing, uh, undoubtedly, but primarily. Foundationally, this has to be political. And central to that political attempt is maintaining a harmonious center state relationship. If you do not have that political will and political zeal, okay, it can go waver anytime. Okay, it can it can uh, it can get diluted okay, and become divisive anytime. So so therefore, 
the question of center state relations question of a democratic federal relationship becomes important and to very quickly point out the the existence of i mean no society can uh, expect total harmony and unity i mean there are all, always uh, fault lines in every society because of its huge diversity okay diverse societies are much more uh, pregnant with that kind of fault lines and these fault lines okay if they manifest themselves in a democratic form okay that would be desirable but if you do not address them democratically okay there could be uh, some kind of dangerous phase so therefore uh, when when we when we map this i think we need to pay attention to these different movements for new state new movements for statehood okay statehood movements emerged okay there were different kinds of uh, social movements which were articulating these differences and congress especially from the 70s onwards especially under mrs gandhi because if you look at the history of congress from 60s onwards you see contestations okay developing against the congress in 1967 in seven states non congress governments came to power so therefore congress started realizing that this is not our uh, glorious phase in the 50s and early 60s it was the congress dominated polity and what was the standard response of the congress especially in the 70s as the tensions developed i mean i don't need to go into the details you are all familiar with the jp movement for instance we are all familiar with the uh, state uh, hood movements in different parts of 69 telangana movement so on so forth uh, so the point is that all these movements which were demanding some kind of democratic attention and resolution were branded by indira regime as fisiferous tendencies as tendencies against the national unity and integrity okay and the result of that kind of mindset of treating any protest any difference of opinion as disintegrating force was as culminated in the emergency emergency was the result of that kind of mindset okay and i mean if if one has to seriously paradise indian political history obviously one would say pre emergency post colonial history of india pre emergency india and post emergency india so emergency is a very very important kind of uh, phase in the history of india so th th this is the background okay uh, of the congress party congress way of uh, translating its idea of nationalism into practice very clearly the congress by 1970s I mean, without a exaggeration one can very clearly say that congress harmonious integrative okay tolerant nationalism degenerated by 70s okay resulting in the emergency that degeneration is manifest in treating every kind of protest as disintegrating force and coming to the present context of the debate on indian nationalism okay it's it's deeply informed by the unitarian hindutva view which clearly goes against the pluralist view of nationalism okay and as a result of which all these differences okay are seen as contra to the indian unity things like that that i will come to later later now uh, one of the considerations i mean historical considerations in understanding indian nationalism to my mind is to realize the fact that after nationalism the question of development political economy all these are all modernist ideas so to understand this i think we need to have some understanding of the differential trajectory of modernity in india i think we we need to identify two different trajectories of modernity it's a very slow torturous painful process one is the kind of trajectory of modernity that we see in the colonial british india okay which is very developed part in terms of education in terms of uh, industrialization in terms of agricultural development okay even the cultural development contra the british 
for instance, cultural renaissance, literary flourish, okay. In all these respects, the colonial India, whether it's British colonial, French colonial, or Portuguese colonial, was far more advanced compared to the native princely India. I mean, I don't need to labor on this point because as part of the Telangana movement, we, we very, very uh, deliberately and uh, in a very longish way reflected on this, why Telangana cannot be, uh, cannot uh, live harmoniously with Koslandra because of this uneven development, okay, uh, which is essentially means uneven trajectory of more modernity. And similarly, if you look at the Marathwada movement or if you look at other uh, similar demands, okay, you see the same kind of thing. Uh, so with this uh, broad uh, theoretical uh, map, okay, we need to approach uh, the, the question of periodization of Indian federalism. And uh, when we talk about Indian federalism, okay, uh, we, we not merely take the government formation into consideration. Okay, we, we need to take uh, both the history, political economy, and also uh, the, the cultural differences, so on and so on. So based on that complex map, okay, uh, we can divide, uh, uh, we can identify three phases in uh, the post-independent India's history, uh, basically keeping centralization, decentralization, center-state relations in view. First phase is from 1947 to 77, okay which can be considered as a high point of centralization, okay? Uh, and capturing that, uh, many political scientists, for instance, Rajni Kothari's uh, calls the 1960s, 70s, I mean, the book was written somewhere in the 70s. Uh, it considers it as a system. Congress is not a political party, it's a system. So Congress system, okay, legitimizing itself, taking upon itself the responsibility of both the nation building and state building. Okay, after independence, okay, assumed a hegemonic position. And it sought to, through its practice, largely because of the kind of uh, charisma, credibility the nationalist leader, especially Nehru had. Um, who, who, who had, which regional leader or which political party leader had that kind of caliber and status to question Nehru. So therefore that charisma uh, uh, that he, Accumulated from the his role in the nationalist movement, also in the post-independence uh, uh, period, uh, as the tallest leader of the Congress Party. Okay, he tried to pursue the or pave the way for, if not pursue, pave the way for the centralization of Indian politics, which took. Please note this, which took the garb of what can be called the nationization of Indian politics. Okay, so nation center okay, unity becomes the priority. And therefore, if you look at even the academic intellectual representations of India, I, mean, I would immediately give two examples. One is the British uh, political scientist who wrote a book, Indian Government and Politics, uh, in 1971, Maurice Jones, a very famous, highly respected political scientist. And uh, to take an Indian example, for instance, Rajni Kothari, who again in the 1970s, 75 or so, he wrote his book, Politics India. Both of them try to see India from above with India nation and center as primary, and the states, provinces, regions as secondary and derivative. That clearly reflects uh, this, this uh, imagination of India from a centralist kind of point of view, which dominated Indian politics from 1947 till emergency. So today, suppose if somebody has to write a book on Indian politics, one cannot afford to do that. Uh, take a top-down view. You have to invariably take bottom up, uh, bottom up because of the assertion of the regions, uh, politically, socially, economically, culturally, which I will come to uh, a little later. So, therefore, when when we when we examine, okay, both the political history and also uh, India as 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 a an accepting electoral democracy, okay, uh, we we need to take this point of view. Even electoral mobilization was happening that, okay. Uh, political parties were built from top down, mobilization was uh, happening, elections uh, were seen from that prism, so on and so forth. Uh, what has happened as a result of is that the Congress party primarily and other political parties sought to mobilize Indian electorate by not challenging the existing identities based on caste, tribe, religion, etc because they saw all these identities to be easily available 
could be made use of and if necessary wherever necessary manipulate them okay and why why i'm making this point because uh, the center state relation is not merely political organizational issue it's also a substantive social issue and the indian the indian republic's journey with a new constitution starts with a promise okay the promise which uh, is very eloquently expressed by dr b r ambedkar in his last speech to the constituent assembly uh, the, the title of the last speech was life of contradictions there he says that with this constitution we are entering into a life of contradictions contradiction between the legal constitutional equality legal constitutional political equality that the constitution gives by giving each individual on the basis of the adult franchise one man one person one vote but in reality in the social and political economic uh, in the economic domain it's not one person one value it's unequal values each person has unequal value depending on his caste his religion his social status so on and so forth so therefore ambedkar dr ambedkar said that this contradiction between political equality and social economic equality okay would run its course after independent after we adopt this constitution become a republic and therefore he alerted that we must consciously address this we cannot just pay, ignore that okay but what has really happened is that almost all the political parties okay unfortunately including the communist parties have made use of the existing identities existing structures of caste religion tribe to mobilize electoral support okay and what happens as a result of this is instead of these structures getting okay challenged and negated they get strengthened that's what has happened so therefore to my mind caste in present india is not the traditional 17th century caste or, or 6th century caste it's a modern avatar of the caste that we find in india and ignoring that advice of dr ambedkar okay what has what a, what all has happened is just in contravention is, with his prescient forewarning okay uh, so therefore there are deeper social fault lines that have instead of being removed eliminated have got strengthened maybe in new form in a modified form okay let me come to the second phase from 77 to 1989 uh, this uh, phase can be called the transitional phase okay uh, though congress uh, came back to power in 1980 uh, but that was not the congress of 1960s and 70s okay Our congress of even emergency period it's a much more weakened congress okay therefore the american political leader rodolph rodolph say that uh, the coming back of congress to power in 1980 is not restoration of the party but just a comeback okay you are gone and come back and because the very political logic civil society logic in indian uh, society has totally changed though janta experiment was a short uh, run experiment it was a short in interregnum policy but the kind of uh, ecos vibrations that it had created okay uh, could not be said to have lost it their potential and they become they get realized in the subsequent decades okay so the legacy of the janta experiment post emergency experiment in fact continues uh, in a much much later period one of the important uh, uh, manifestation of this decline of the congress system or what uh, political science called one party dominant system headed by the congress okay seen again is the backdrop of emergency is the emergence rise and consolidation of regional parties to give a quick example telugu desham party for instance in 1980s uh, 82 83 is a clear uh, challenge to the congress party and its nationalist uh, credentials along with this okay to understand the social political change we need to also understand the massive expansion of the civil and subaltern spheres in the post emergency period look at the plethora of social movements that emerged in the post emergence period uh, civil rights movement student movement uh, farmers movement 
course, most of them are rich farmers' movement for remunerative prices and things of that kind. Uh, tribal movement, women's movement, movements against uh, ecological degradation, and with so-called environmental movements. All these movements, in fact, uh, strengthen the civil society. So, therefore, a new kind of tension develops between party politics and civil society social politics and electoral politics and very clearly okay the ideological sources of these civil society subaltern movements are different from that of the inspirations to the political parties i mean congress party totally uh iconizes nehru okay and gandhi and others get marginalized and interestingly all these subaltern civil society movements in fact have somebody like ambedkar gandhi lohe as their ideological inspirations so therefore, different kind of logic, political and electoral logic and social, cultural, uh, mass movement logic could be seen emerging in the post-emergence period. And what has happened in the 1990s, okay, is nothing but a, a continuation of this. Therefore, I'm emphasizing this uh, civil society and the subaltern. And all these movements obviously were in favor of democratic decentralization. All these movements, in fact, were supplying the substance, the ideological popular meat to the renegotiation of center state relations in a democratic fashion. The third phase, obviously, is uh, the coalitional phase, 1989 to 2014. Uh, you have seen uh, four, and if you are liberal, you can say five, five coalitional governments, okay, National Front uh, Coalition in 1989 to 91. United Front 96 to 98. Intermittently, you had Congress in power in India, but that too, uh, as a party supported externally by other political. And NDA won uh, 98 to 2004, okay, and UPA won, and also to some extent NDA too. So what I'm trying to draw your attention to is that uh, these coalitional governments become important when we look at them from the question of federalism in India. Uh, is that uh, they, 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 in fact, recognized, willingly partnered with, coalitioned with regional parties and also small parties. Because the whole logic of arithmetic of Indian democracy, okay, moved away from one party dominance to a different kind of reality. Maybe uh, if you're cynical, you can say one party dominance till 70s to another period of one party dominance in the 2014 after. <laughs> anyway, I will not go into that now. So now the point is that uh, every political regional party, smaller regional parties, because I mean, all these are large coalition, the 13, 14, 17 political parties were part of that. So therefore, all these parties became part of the government formation and much more importantly, part of the governance process. Invariably, this coalitional phase in Indian politics had to take into cognizance not merely the political spatial diversity in India, but also regional specificities, aspirational specificities, okay, in, in, in the formation of the national government. That's the point which we need to, okay. And what adds complexity to this is the context of liberalization. Liberalization economic reforms cannot be confined to only the center or national government. Given the complexity and size of India, diversity of India, each region and state government had to be part of that. Okay. And it's a big change from command economy, dirigento policy regime to, uh, to, to neoliberal regime. So therefore, many of these actors okay, had to become active participant in the opening of Indian economy. And what is important to note is that the multi-party coalition at the center provided space for these regional governments, regional state governments, okay, to evolve their own policy mechanisms. So therefore, the logic of regionalization of Indian politics became very dominant kind of theme for almost two and a half to three decades in the Indian politics in the post-emergency period. <laughs> How much time can I take? Uh, 
another 5 10 minutes oh 5 10 minutes yeah okay okay no no i'll take another 15 minutes okay yeah okay yeah. so the point is that um, uh, what what are the um, I mean, how do you how do you conceptualize these processes okay firstly how do you how do you conceptualize this change firstly uh, there is a relation of uh, indian police that's happening okay and interestingly the nation, so called national parties have shown their uh, inclination to reconcile with the presence and strength of the regional parties that's point number 1 secondly corresponding to this we have a reconfiguration of political and electoral contestation which was confined to two parties okay in the national assembly two national parties will fight each, each other but what you have is the shift of emphasis from party to coalition it's not two national parties it's two national coalitions in which the regional parties are very very central okay and but another important thing that we need to note is that whenever a national party resisted this regional assertion especially in the case of the congress the regional unit okay moved away from the party and became a new party new regional party and to retain its symbolic association okay it still continued to be a congress party like trinamool congress national congress party ysr cp ysr congress party all these are nothing but offshoots of the congress party which emerged basically because of the uh, intolerance and the other ends to that centralizing logic okay and coming to the bjp i mean we all think that bjp is an all india party with a with a strong internal ideological homogeneity and organizational in, in uniformity but if you look at the rise and uh, consolidation of the bjp to my mind it's a highly accommodative party okay it accommodated the regional specificities regional heterogeneities both social and cultural heterogeneities okay therefore it would not be far from true to say that bjp in gujarat is different from bjp in madhya pradesh uh, bjp in rajasthan is different from bjp in karnataka it has a different kind of uh, not not merely the face but different kind of uh, ideological presentation for instance if you take hindutva the kind of hindutva that you see in rajasthan okay uh, uh, one one old friend uh, the british political scientist robert jenkins he said he called it uh, shakavati rajput hindutva maybe karnataka hindutva is more of a lingayat hindutva so in, even in terms of ideological composition there is heterogeneity there is tolerance and accommodation of so ideologically in terms of leadership and the social base and also organizational kind of structuring bjp has presented itself to be very very flexible and accommodating therein lies its strength but today what is happening is uh, uh, is contrary to that uh, development i mean if that kind of flexibility were, were not to be there you couldn't have imagined a state level leader a chief minister of state becoming prime minister because every we take a congress party there there is clearly marked national leaders and state leaders likewise in the bjp also there are certain national leaders who may not have much stay stay and saying in regional politics but they are national leaders okay and regional leaders but that uh, easy flexibility in fact makes this transference okay moving from uh, forward and backward easy and modi phenomenon is in fact illustration of that to my mind so therefore the decentralization logic uh, uh, could be conceptualized uh, in two terms one is there is a regionalization of so called national parties okay uh, as the behavior of even congress uh, uh, afterwards has tried to uh, be very accommodate to the regional uh, dynamics so one one process uh, that we see very clearly is uh, the increasing procl uh, proclivity to present uh, themselves as regional uh, formations by the national parties they are not no longer intolerant as they were during indira gandhi period second is there is also a conscious attempt on the part of the regional parties to nationalize themselves and very clearly for instance you you, you, you would recollect that uh, the tdp though it was a regional party confined to the telugu state 
uh, had a, a, in its manifesto a statement on uh, foreign policy. How can you reason about that? <laughs> okay, uh, something to say on uh, I mean, that was a kind of ambition, you know, we, we are also not just regional, but we are national parties. Okay. So now this uh, logic, okay, of nation and nation, nationalization and regionalization is seen to be uh, challenged, controverted, okay, somewhat disrupted by the developments that we have seen, we, we have seen uh, Indian politics since 2014, since the emergence of uh, BJP led NDA two, uh, and become much more manifest after 2009 election. Then BJP on its own could uh, could uh, have its own majority. It doesn't uh, any longer need the support of uh, regional uh, parties who are who are the partners in the coalition. Now the question that I am trying to address is. Some, almost, almost everybody, journalists, uh, political commentators, everybody recognizes that uh, 2014 onwards, there is a very clear tendency towards centralization of politics, decision making, and pressurizing from above. Okay. And that is also clear in uh, the comparison that is sought to be drawn uh, between Narendra Modi and Indira Gandhi. But my question is that is it a phenomenon which can be reduced to the persona or is it a deeper reflection of a deeper ideological process? That is the question which I think we need to answer. To my mind, the centralization of politics and the lapses in the democratic center state relations that we see today is informed by a deeper ideological shift. That is the rise of Hindutva notion of nationalism. Hindutva idea of nationalism okay, imagines India to be a unitarian nation, not the plural heterogeneous, heterogeneous nation. It's a unitary kind of nation. Okay. Corresponding to that, you see this talk of one nation, one tax, one nation, one election, so on and so forth. We are all familiar with that. So the, the point is that that is not just a political persona, personality related and, uh, and, and party related, but it's a deep process deeply informed by the ideological proclivity. Okay. And this is manifest in variety of things that have happened okay say for instance the uh, interstate council which which is a constitutionally mandated uh, body you know it, it, it's it's a, it's sanctioned by article 263 of indian constitution and uh, whose role has been emphasized by various commissions sarkaria commission mm punji commission so on and so forth okay to to negotiate the center state relations to to create a platform for the states to articulate their interests, okay, their aspirations. That has been more or less uh, rendered uh, dormant. And replacement of the planning commission by Niti Aayog. Okay, Niti Aayog sounds very neoliberal. Okay, And uh, the kind of uh, okay, fate that RBI, uh, which is a chief arbiter of monetary policy, uh, is being sidelined. And the controversies surrounding uh, election commission, central agencies, so on and so forth, the Kashmir issue, all these things clearly show and demonstrate uh, the central Asian logic in, in practice, in operation, in active operation. Okay. Now, this raises the question is it viable? Is it sustainable? Firstly, because of the diversity of India, both as a society, Polity and economy. Secondly, because of the fact that for two, two to three decades, India has seen okay, regional parties playing a central role, and each each state creating its own policy model, developmental model, welfareist policy model. It's not just a regional party coming to power. Each party tried to define its own model of development and welfare, whether it is right or wrong, whether we agree, it's a different issue. But regional aspiration, regional 
assertion identity are seen in the policy making process itself. So when this has happened, is it possible to visualize India as a centralized kind of okay state, centralized kind of state power? Obviously, this neo centralizing tendency okay attracts its own challenges. I mean, to recollect, uh, re to re recollect uh, NTR in the 1980s very, very famously said uh, when when he was uh, fighting against his, uh, his remo uh, government's removal in the 1985, uh, 84, sorry, 84. Uh, he said center is a myth. So it is not complete reality. States are complete. Centrism. I mean, though N.T. Ramarao is not uh, considered to be a great political pundit, but I think he was expressing something very interesting kind of idea. So now the point is that uh, in the present kind of centralizing dispensation, okay, uh, what are the uh, challenges that could come? Okay. Now here I would try to. Uh, I mean, we we all know that. Uh, the, except a few exceptions, not many regional parties are raising the issue of democratic center state relations, except the Namul Congress and few other voices. Now the question is that if the political parties, especially the regional parties, who how to or who ought to legitimately raise the question of state autonomy, democratic center, if that doesn't raise then what would happen? To my mind, if the formal political structures like political parties okay, and institutions okay, do not come up to the task, then the challenge could come from civil society and subaltern society. I'll just give an example and conclude. We are all familiar with the Jelly Cut to Marina Occupy movement. Okay? What was the spirit of that movement? I mean, Tamil Nadu, given its anti brahmin and anti Hindi historical background, okay, Jellikattu was possible. Jellikattu movement was, in fact, asserting that Jellikattu, I mean, we all know that it's a very cruel kind of game, okay, but yet Jellikattu became the cultural symbol of Tamil identity. And they were arguing that our identity is being violated. So, therefore, we will pursue this. I mean, it may be. Uh, May not be acceptable acceptable that's a different question so therefore what we need to see what in, how do how do we need to read jellica to marina movement i think uh, the dissent against the centralizing logic okay, has essentially come from the civil society from bottom civil and subaltern society so therefore when regional parties fail to okay raise this issue then obviously the challenge could come from different sectors, unexpected sectors. And as Dr. Ambedkar very clearly uh, said in some of his writings and speeches, that nationalism is generally uh, tended to be used by uh, leaders, the elite, to safeguard their political power, not to safeguard democracy. And if we pursue this logic of centralization, obviously democracy will be in peril. Therefore, it's 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 important to remember that prescient advice that we need to, if we, if we want India to be a unity, India to progress politically, economically, socially, democratically, then we need to respect the different parts, okay, the components that together constitute India and Indian identity. If we neglect that, okay, we would be putting Indian democracy in peril. And therefore, we need to. Uh, to, to be vigilant, okay, to protect our unity, national integration, and also democracy. I think I will stop it here. Sorry if I have taken more time. I'll stop it here and thank you very much. It's a wonderful lecture. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Professor K. Srinivasilgaru, for sharing your valuable thoughts in, in this endowment lecture. Sir, you have rightly articulated your arguments that a strong center state relations leads to a strong nation irrespective of political differences and ideologies. Uh, yes, sir, our federal system functions in a healthy environment based on conflict, resolutions, initiatives, progressive cooperation and adjustments. 
sir, I am sure the next generation of the youth will focus on these aspects. Once again, I thank you, sir. Now, I request Professor B. Venkatram Redigaru, Rishan Kagati University, to uh, present vote of thanks. Distinguished President of this Sendamus Lecture, my Honorable Vice Chancellor, the Pakistan University Professor Ramesh Garu, distinguished dignitaries on the dais and off the dais, respected participants, good afternoon to one another. At the outset, I pay my important tribute to Dr. K. Jayashankar Garu, veteran of Telangana's brave philosopher and discussionist, and uh, Education Minister, with the, whose blessings that I am here and associate with you on this morning, I am really blessed with the death of late Dr. Jashankar Bhatt. I feel it is a great pleasure to be with all of you this morning with the great personalities on the dais. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, members of the Security Council, Staff and students of Kartan State, I express my deep sense of gratitude to Sri Banda Prakash Yadu, member of Raj Sabha, and secretary of Dr. Jashankar Sir Trust, for having attended this endowment lecture virtually from Delhi. I professionally thank Professor Yang Nilagamurti Gadu, former Vice Chancellor and Chairman of the Trust, for having spoken about the Great personality of Dr. Jashankar Garu. And I thank Professor Shankar Garu, former Registrar of this University, for having spoken on the great characteristics of Professor Jashankar Garu and also blessed us and also conveyed the blessings and wishes to progress this university. And also spoken about today's speaker uh, on the ninth endowment lecture, Professor Srinivasan Garu. I hold on to with thank today's keynote speaker, Professor Srinivasan Garu, senior fellow from ICSSR, for having given elaborating, informative, and thought provoking lecture on nationalism and dynamics of federal politics in contemporary India, and spare his valuable time for this occasion. I profusely thank all the members of the Executive Council for having graced this uh, lecture offline and online. I also thank Professor Murli Manohar Garu, Professor Samay Garu, Professor Krishnamachari Garu for having attended and graced this occasion. I thank the family members of the Dr. Jashankar Garu for having associated with this endowment lecture. My sincere thanks to all the administrative officers, teaching and non teaching staff, and students for their presence physically and virtually for this memorial lecture on Dr. Jashankar Garu. I thank all the participants who have attended the lecture virtually. Lastly, but not least, I profusely thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Ramesh Garu, who decided and uh, having given inaugural remarks on the endowment lecture and executed its proceedings in very cordial atmosphere. Finally, I thank the university website in charge, Dr. Rama and her team, and also thank Mr. Banukar for arranging this platform for endowment lecture for offline and online. I thank press and electronic media personnel for having publicized this memorial lecture to reach all the people. Thank you, one and all, for having participated this endowment lecture. Thank you. <laughs>